uh, to talk about Turkey and Russia in the region. Um, as the person who works on Turkey, I will focus my, uh, my remarks on Turkey's foreign policy and highlight uh, Turkey's foreign policy in the Middle East and highlight where they intersect uh, with the Russians. But I think that it's important to kind of understand in a broad way what is motivating Turkey's uh, role in the region and what the Turks are and, and, and why they're doing what they're doing in places like Syria and places like Libya, uh, Jerusalem, uh, and the Persian Gulf uh, more generally. And I think there are really three factors. Um, the first is um, what from the Turkish perspective is they are acting on principle. Second, they are providing uh, in, in consistent with uh, uh, Ottoman history, they are, they are providing responsible leadership and a certain amount of Muslim solidarity in the region. And then finally, there's geostrategic considerations. Um, uh, they're all related to each other in important ways, um, and each one can be used to buttress the other reason for what Turkey is doing uh, around the region. But before I get into a little bit more detail, I just want to I, I want to highlight a, a, a caveat. Um, that is that the role that Turkey is playing or seeking to play in the region is not just about Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Um, he is, without a doubt, the sun around which um, Turkish politics revolves. But there is a broader constituency for a more active Turkish foreign policy. Uh, and it, the argument in Turkey has, until very recently, mostly been about domestic politics and, and far less about the Justice and Development Party's um, more, more active role in, in the Middle East. But let me very quickly go through those three factors that have been motivating uh, Turkish foreign policy in, in the region. First, uh, on, on principle. And, and then Prime Minister uh, Erdogan uh, in, in Turkey, pre-2013 Turkey, built much of the country's soft power in the Middle East on this idea of principle and as it related to uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict and Israeli conduct in the Gaza Strip. Um, this made Erdogan enormously popular around the region, uh, made him enormously popular at home as well. Uh, and there was always this effort to uh, highlight the fact that Turkey was standing on principle uh, in keeping with UN Security Council resolutions, as opposed to, for example, the United States and other countries in the region, which shied away from uh, bold and broad uh, denunciations of Israeli conduct uh, with regard to the Palestinians. Um, uh, post the, uh, uh, after Bashar al-Assad militarized uh, the uprising in Syria, um, President Erdogan garnered a significant amount of political mileage out of taking a principled position on the fact that Bashar al-Assad must go, must leave, there must be regime change. Uh, in Syria. This was important because he had spent the previous uh, six or seven years um, uh, establishing closer relations with the, with the Assad regime. And of course, there are many other examples of this. Uh, the principal position which the Turks took on the coup d'etat in Egypt in July 2013, for example. Um, all of these things uh, accrue to Erdogan's domestic politics, but importantly, speaks to the second factor that the Turks are trying to uh, that, that motivate Turkish foreign policy and that um, they believe advances their role in the region, which is uh, leadership uh, and Muslim solidarity uh, in the region. And then just for a moment, let me offer a little bit of background here. The Justice and Development Party, the AKP, that Erdogan leads has a, a, a version of Ottoman history that is rather benign. And um, since most Turks don't really have access to their own history because of language reforms that Mustafa Kemal Ataturk undertook after the founding of the Republic, um, this, uh, the AKP has been able to leverage this, this version of Ottoman history to its great advantage. Um, in the first iteration of the Justice and Development Party, um, Turkey was a troubleshooter, a fixer in the region. Um, this didn't bother too many other people. It certainly didn't bother the United States, even if it kind of rankled people like Husni Mubarak in Egypt and other leaders in, in, in the region. And, and this played well at home. Um, and it even played well uh, among some within uh, the region. Um, they have sought to play this leadership role in Syria uh, as a leading voice uh, in 
providing support previously for Syrian refugees uh, in Jerusalem, uh, in Libya, uh, against the blockade of Qatar that began in 2017. Um, this leadership position that the Turks have sought to take uh, has remained even as their strategic position in the Middle East cratered after 2013. Um, even, and that strategic position cratered um, in large part because of the principled stand that the Turks believed they were taking uh, with regard to the ouster of Mohamed Morsi in Egypt and the Turks swinging their doors open to members of the Muslim Brotherhood and other dissidents uh, in, in Egypt. Um, unfortunately, this has left the Turks with, with very few allies in the region beyond the Brotherhood, the Qataris, and, and, and Hamas. And finally, um, geostrategic concerns. And this is really more where Turkey intersects with Russia, um, uh, in both Syria as well as in Libya. Um, with the United States removing itself from the Syrian conflict, uh, and the United States not wanting to do essentially what the Turks wanted them to do, which is march an army into Damascus and bring down the Assad regime, the Turks had to go to Moscow if they wanted their interests uh, protected in, uh, in, uh, in Syria. And um, that has worked to some extent to their benefit as well as their disadvantage because it has given Vladimir Putin a significant amount of leverage over uh, Turkey's interests and Turkey's room for maneuver in, uh, in Syria. But nevertheless, um, this uh, pragmatic, some would say, move to the Russians uh, has also led to other developments and, uh, and uh, development of Russian-Turkish ties. Uh, in Libya, and I, I will note that in Syria, Turkey and Russia are on opposite ends of the conflict but nevertheless have been able to compartmentalize that to advance their interests as they see them. And it's a similar type of situation in Libya. Uh, in Libya, they are at opposite ends of the conflict, um, but uh, nevertheless uh, have, despite from time to time, having differences and public differences, uh, they um, have been able to manage uh, those differences. The, thing that is really driving the Turks in Libya is the belief that they themselves are being choked off geostrategically by burgeoning relations between Greece and Egypt, uh, Greece, Cyprus, Israel, uh, and that in their own backyard, which is the Mediterranean, uh, the Turks would uh, have very few options to them. And thus they struck this deal uh, with, uh, with the Libyans. So taken all together, um, Turkey, despite considerable setbacks, has sought to continue to play uh, an active role in the region through both principle, through leadership, and through its own uh, geo reading of the geostrategic environment. That has brought them, ironically, in, uh, I don't want to say in, in, in a class, but in competition in ways with the Russians, while at the same time, the Turkish-Russian relationship uh, has developed in ways that have raised concerns here in Washington, D.C. I'll stop there and let uh, Eugene cover the, the Russian end of things. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. So um, in the past five years, we have seen a huge transformation in Russia's role in the Middle East, which came to many as a surprise because for the previous 25 years or so, since the end of the Cold War and the breakup of the Soviet Union, we grew accustomed to Russia not being a player in the Middle East. Uh, and we accepted that as a new normal of sorts. And that's wrong because really historically speaking, if you pull back the historical camera and open the aperture quite a bit, uh, uh, you can't help but realize that Russia has been a major presence in the Middle East for centuries going back to depending on how you want to count uh, to the 18th and 19th century uh, there are sort of these little perhaps not very significant to an outside observer to uh, um, you know but to, 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 to many Russians very significant uh, things like um, you know throughout Russian literature uh, 
the rivalry with Turkey for access to um, first the Black Sea, uh, then uh, to the Mediterranean has been one of the major themes in Russian military history. Uh, the greatest Russian military commanders, uh, the names of Alexander Suvorov, uh, Kutuzov, Admiral Nahimov, are um, sort of enshrined uh, in, in, in Russian history, in Russian minds, as the founders of the, you know, uh, a Russian empire, people who really built the empire. But the wars that they fought were, uh, to a very large extent, wars against Turkey, uh, in the uh, 18th and 19th century for access to the Black Sea, uh, for lands that are presently part of Ukraine, um, but were then uh, part of the Ottoman either sphere of influence or uh, an outright empire. Now in 2014, we uh, were shocked when Russia annexed Crimea, uh, but uh, Crimea and uh, the war with Turkey, Britain and France uh, in the 19th century, all that um, has deep historical roots and uh, resonates in uh, Russian culture to many Russian minds as something that is um, inalienable from Russian history, from uh, Russian foreign policy, from Russian pursuits uh, in the Middle East. So that period of about 25 or so years, since about 1989 or um, uh, 1991, depending on how you count, when the Soviet Union broke up to about 2015, really was an aberration with Russia absent by and large from the Middle East. Now, in 2015, uh, uh, Russia reached a critical moment because at that point it seemed that um, um, uh, the regime of Bashar al-Assad was on the brink of collapse and the choice before, uh, between uh, the Kremlin, uh, be before the Kremlin was between letting the last um, Russian partner in the Middle East collapse and lose uh, face uh, as, uh, as a patron of, um, uh, in, in, in relationship to a significant client, or to intervene. And against uh, all our expectations, uh, uh, Russia intervened and, uh, accomplished much more than uh, was at the time expected. You may recall that uh, uh, in the fall of 2015, when Russia intervened militarily with boots on the ground and most importantly, planes in Syrian airspace, the expectation was that there would be multiple casualties of Russian troops, that there would be body bags coming back to Russia, and everybody was still um, recalling the experience of Afghanistan. What that hasn't happened, and with that military and geopolitically speaking a master stroke, Putin and his generals have accomplished a great deal. They position themselves squarely at the intersection of many Middle Eastern interests. Uh, they have succeeded in making Russia great again, to borrow an ex uh, a frame from, phrase from our own political vocabulary. Um, they have reestablished uh, several very important relationships with them in, throughout the Middle East. And um, they have um, reshaped their relationship with Turkey, um, which um, 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 have had been uh, following a pretty interesting path since the breakup of the Soviet Union, because on the one hand, the commercial relationship between Russia and Turkey really blossomed after 1991, but on the other hand, they remained rivals. Um, Russians don't forget that Turkey was uh, supportive of, for example, the Chechen fighters during the 1990s, during the war in the breakaway republic uh, in Chechnya. And also very importantly, um, they do have overlapping um, claims to a sphere of influence with the Caucasus uh, traditionally in more recent history as being part of the Russian sphere of influence and uh, Turkey is still looking to uh, perhaps expand its influence in Azerbaijan and Georgia, the two countries that have chosen to uh, pursue a somewhat, uh, well, certainly in the case of Georgia, a pro-Western foreign policy. So um, uh, the Kremlin, Russia has used this opportunity to uh, um, kind of jump into the Middle East and fray. 
uh, to uh, put Turkey in a difficult situation um, uh, uh, because clearly um, uh, with Russia militarily present uh, in Syria, Turkey cannot accomplish its goal in Syria. Uh, the deployment has served as a very important proving ground for Russian operational concepts and for uh, Russian weaponry. Um, also, I think it's worth saying something about the personal relationship uh, as it looks to me, sort of from a Russian perspective, between Putin and Erdogan. Uh, it's, uh, Stephen, I don't know if you'll agree with me, something like a love-hate relationship. Both are outcasts of Europe, are rejected by Europe and criticized by Europe heavily for many years for uh, their respective uh, transgressions against uh, democratic governance in their countries. Um, both have um, kind of recalled the imperial legacies of their uh, countries. Uh, and that's where the two come uh, uh, in, in, into competition, uh, in a sense. Uh, I would also stress that um, uh, a very important moment for the personal relationship between Putin and Erdogan was in 2016 when everybody in Europe and in Washington recoiled from uh, um, uh, the, the possibility of intervening in the coup in Turkey in 2016, uh, not quite knowing what to do. Uh, but Putin jumped in and embraced Erdogan and even reportedly offered military help uh, to put down the coup. So um, it, it's, it's, it's a very complicated dynamics. We can get into this uh, in more detail, but uh, with uh, just a couple of concluding words about uh, the situation in Idlib, my thing of the tea leaves, again, sitting in Washington, you can only do so and so much, is that basically neither party to that situation, putting aside those who are uh, much more on the ground, the Syrian uh, presence and um, the opposition, uh, but between Turkey and Russia, neither side can really accomplish what it wants. And that's why we see this tug of war um, and the highs and the lows in their relationship more, more recently. Uh, for um, uh, Erdogan, the risk of an outright confrontation militarily with Russia is not something that he's looking for. And the same applies to Putin. I'll stop at that. Thank you. Right, excellent. Thank, thank you both. Um, Stephen, you used a really excellent word, I think, to to describe part of the relationship, and you said that they're that they're good at compartmentalizing. So I'd like to just turn quickly, and, and Eugene, you started to outline some of this, but um, but some of the areas where Russia and Turkey's interests do overlap, and how would how might an increasingly tense situation in the Middle East affect that? Will they be able to continue to compartmentalize? So. Um, Stephen, do, do you want to take that first, and then we'll turn to you, Eugene? Sure, that's that's fine um, with me, of course. Um, it it strikes me that where the Russians and the Turks are going to overlap are precisely the places where they overlap now. Um, overlap is either good or bad, but in this case, they are at opposite ends of the conflicts in Libya and in Syria. Now, as Eugene pointed out, this is a complicated relationship between two men as well as a complicated relationship between, uh, between two countries. And um, we did see the limits of it uh, relatively recently when in response to the Russian and Syrian regime's assault on Idlib, the Turks took a fairly significant military action against regime forces uh, in response to their own forces being killed, although their own forces being killed were more likely to have been killed by Russians rather than Syrians and Iranians. But uh, the uh, Turks demonstrated the superiority of a NATO uh, military that's well equipped. And the Russians were really forced to stand by and have and let the Turks have their go at Syrian forces and did a significant amount of damage to Syrian uh, regime forces in the process. Um, that hasn't really undermined the relationship between the two. Um, uh, Erdogan went and paid a visit to Putin and they hammered out a deal which looked a lot like the deal that they had hammered out a number of years earlier 
to establish a ceasefire, which only underlines what Eugene is talking about, is that in Syria, it seems unlikely that either one is going to get what they want in Syria. I'm not entirely convinced. It's certainly the case that Putin is, and Eugene knows this better than, than, than I do, but it's certainly the case that Vladimir Putin is committed to uh, Bashar al-Assad and the Assad regime, not because he loves Bashar al-Assad or loves Syrians, but because he has a broader geostrategic view. And Erdogan figures into that. Erdogan is a partner of sorts of Putin's while remaining within NATO. And that necessarily weakens NATO. And I think that that is part of what is, is going on here. So this overlap in Syria provides further opportunity for, uh, for the Russians in a way that it doesn't actually in, in Libya, because they're not so up against each other. And those, uh, and those, uh, those concerns are, uh, the concerns that each have in Libya are somewhat different. Um, in Libya, uh, the Turks, uh, again, standing on principle, uh, they are supporting the UN recognized, the internationally recognized government. Um, there's this kind of larger Muslim leadership in the former Ottoman realm. Um, it, certainly Turkey likes to position itself as a leader of a, um, I don't want to use the term Islamist camp because it conjures different things, but there is an Islamist element to the internationally recognized government in Libya um, that is a motivating factor for, uh, for them. And uh, this, I think, uh, and then the, obviously the geostrategic concerns that I laid out in my opening remarks, this puts them in conflict with the Russians, but that conflict hasn't really come out in, 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 in the same kind of way that it had most recently uh, in Syria. What will push it to the breaking point? unclear. Um, it was a pretty significant uh, military action uh, that the Turks took, uh, but were careful in avoiding the Russians, even though everybody suspects the Russians were actually, uh, were actually um, responsible. And although the Turks remain faithful to the idea that Assad must go, in practical reality, they have dropped that, uh, perhaps in deference to what Putin's wishes are and what they hope to get out of Putin, which is protection from a Kurdish, independent, semi-autonomous, whatever you want to call it, state-lit entity, whatever, in, uh, in northern Syria. I've probably forgotten six different things, so uh, I can pass that one over to, to Eugene. Um, I agree with what uh, Stephen said very much, a couple of additional points. Um, I think that um, the economic relationship between the two is still quite important. Uh, now, there's going to be a drop off for sure, uh, as it's going to be everywhere in uh, one of the major elements of that economic relationship, the tourist trade between the two countries, uh, simply because of the uh, pandemic and travel restrictions. Uh, but still, um, you know, they'll be looking to the future where they can restore that relationship. They've talked about expanding bilateral trade to $100 billion from about $30 billion these days, which is a very ambitious goal. But um, they look to that as um, kind of a growth area. Uh, I also think that the two have, I wouldn't call it a shared interest but a parallel interest or an area where they don't contradict each other. And that is uh, they still remain uh, basically um, shunned by Europe, uh, Russia because of their sanctions and the consequences of the um, annexation of Crimea and Putin personally, of course, although he's broken out of that isolation, but of Erdogan too, um, Steve, correct me, or Stephen, rather, correct me if I'm wrong, but there was a period in the 1990s when Turkey really uh, embraced this idea of reforming itself domestically with a view toward uh, uh, joining the European Union. Uh, I recall that when I was in, uh, briefly in our government in the 1990s, this was one of the major themes of our bilateral relationship with Turkey. 
and also trilateral relationship U.S., Europe, uh, Turkey, uh, to promote um, uh, Turkish aspirations for membership in Europe. Now that clearly is not going to happen. And that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, has really left quite an imprint on Turkish attitudes toward Europe and also presumably on Erdogan's views toward Europe as well. So uh, it's, it's, it's this shared kind of position of being outcast. Sorry. Uh, no, 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 I, I started to interrupt you. I'll let you finish and then I'll, I'll respond to your point about Europe. It's an interesting one. Uh, the other aspect of it that, um, you know, again, I, I would repeat what I said before. It's not a shared interest, but it's a situation where, as I see it, neither side is prepared to go all in. And therefore, uh, they have a stake in managing the situation in Syria to an extent so as to not upset the larger bilateral relationship and not let it get out of hand where he would um, draw both of them in more um, uh, and uh, upset their basic equities there. Um, I, I think, you know, on the point of this kind of shared sense of being on the outside and shunned by Europe is, a, is an important one. Um, the real push for EU-related form, reforms came in Turkey in between 1999 and 2005. And it was between late 2002 and 2005 when the AKP, Erdogan's party, was in power. He became prime minister first in March 2003 uh, and oversaw a number of important constitutional reforms that led Turkey to begin its EU accession talks. As soon as those talks began, they almost immediately came to an end over uh, a variety of issues at the time, not really of Turkey's making. Since that time, of course, things have changed dramatically. And it's hard to believe that Turkey will, uh, that, that the, the deep freeze that Turkey's EU negotiations uh, are in will somehow thaw anytime soon. And it reinforced the idea for Erdogan and lots of people around him that the Europeans will always deal with Turkey in a duplicitous manner. Um, and now both of them are, both Erdogan and Putin, for good reason, are accused of violating people's human rights uh, and a whole long laundry list of transgressions that keep them on the outside and, and, and as a result, they have contentious relations with the European Union. This is certainly a point of overlap and something that they both share with regard to, uh, with regard to Europe. And I, I'll point out also that Erdogan, for a number of years has been fond of saying the world is bigger than five. Uh, and what he's saying there is the, that there are other countries, uh, there's actors beyond the EU, there's actors beyond the United States, and Turkey should have its rightful role as a, as a power in, in the country. That five includes Russia, but still it, it, it speaks to this idea that Turkey no longer feels comfortable in these kind of post-World War II, Cold War types of arrangements in which it was part of NATO and therefore constrained from exploring its relations with a, a larger uh, neighbor for which it might have good economic relations. And it feels constrained by uh, the demands of the European Union for which it feels that has never repaid, uh, has never repaid the favor. Um, and so, uh, yes, I think this is also something that is driving the Turkey-Russia relationship um, but again, if you look at it in the Middle East, that relationship, it, it is a clear compartmentalization because in the Middle East, they don't seem to agree on a lot. Right, I agree with that, yeah. So, so we, we do have some questions coming in, but I'll just ask one last one, which actually overlaps with some of them that are coming in by email. Um, that is, um, what do you think will be the result of what's happening in Syria right now? And what, what, what are the consequences? Uh, Eugene, why don't we start with you? Well, as you know, predicting is hard, especially the future. Um, I basically see this situation as a stalemate. Again, um, there are a number of other factors that have intervened that may, again, looking at the Russian side of the ledger, so to speak, that may uh, limit the Kremlin's ability to uh, be involved more aggressively in Syria. Uh, the COVID-19 epidemic and its consequences for 
uh, the Russian economy, an economy which is heavily dependent on exports and the state of the global economy. Um, all that could uh, act as an additional break, I would say, on Russian ambitions. I don't expect Russia to pull back significantly, but I think it poses a, um, a break or a check on their ability to expand uh, their presence uh, if, uh, um, if, if that's what is required. And uh, again, I don't look at the Turkish side so much, but um, I, um, I, I think that um, the same um, sort of uh, limitations of capabilities apply to Turkey because basically uh, Turkey is not willing to risk a major conflict with Russia um, uh, there. So, um, you know, we do have a tendency to think in a linear fashion and project from today to, you know, basically some kind of continuation of the status quo, but uh, I'll err on the side of being linear and say that what we see there now is what we're going to get for some foreseeable future. I, I, I too will shy away from prediction. Uh, nothing good ever came from it, but what uh, I, and I, I come to this though at a, from a somewhat different angle from Eugene's. Um, I, I for one have never believed that, you know, uh, either Assad was gonna go or that the Russians were gonna be successful in the way in which people thought that they might be after initially being quite skeptical of the Russian military intervention. And I, I'll do this by way of analogy. Um, in, next door to Syria is Lebanon where there was a long-term, long-running civil war. That civil war came to an end by basically an Arab League authorized Syrian invasion and occupation of Lebanon that disciplined the political arena in Lebanon. What you have in Syria is the possibility that the Russians could come in and help Bashar al-Assad and related militias and others to defeat their opponents, except for the fact that you have one big thing standing in its way, and that's Turkey. Uh, as much as they are cooperating, the Turks are, uh, from time to time, the Turks could not be confident that the Russians were going to arrange things in Syria in a way that was advantageous to the Turkish position. And so the Turks have taken matters into their own hands. Of course, they have differences with the United States in Syria. Um, but uh, to the extent that Turkey is in a way, by dint of its presence, by dint of pursuing its interests either in Northeast Syria or Northwestern Syria, is playing a blocking role to what the Russians and the Syrians ultimately want to do. Yet at the same time, neither the Russians nor the Turks want to get into an all out fight with each other suggests that we're going to muddle through this phase in ways with an increase in violence and then a decrease in violence and an increase in violence and a decrease in violence. But until the world changes in a way that provides either an opening for the Russians, the Turks, or something dramatic happens in Damascus, uh, I, I think what you see in Syria is what you're going to get. Let's keep in mind also that this is year nine of the Syrian civil war, and civil wars tend to last uh, anywhere between seven and 15 years. So uh, this is just a new phase with the, what the Turks are doing more recently in, in Syria, and it's likely to end up, as Eugene suggested, in, in a stalemate. All right, thank you. So we'll go to some of the questions that are coming in on the Q&A. So the first one is, how long do you think that the accommodation between divergent interests of Russia and Turkey can last? Actors could change their respective calculations. Well, I, I think we've already more or less answered that question. Uh, they, they uh, well, neither side is willing to escalate. Uh, each side is prepared to defend uh, its interests. So I would say this kind of uh, uh, status quo uh, with occasional flare-ups uh, is going to can continue uh, for another six years if Stevens uh, 
assessment of civil war is, is correct. I'm not a social scientist who does numbers, but that number actually struck me. And I often use it when people talk about turning the corner in the Syrian civil war. All right, okay. So, so our next question then is um, for Stephen. And, and could you please comment on uh, Turkey and the Gulf country relations? You mentioned Turkey and Qatar's convergence uh, and also where does Iran fit in? Sure, the, the turkey Qatari convergence um, is something that people have noted um, in, in particular since the uh, Emiratis, Saudis, Egyptians, and Bahrainis imposed a blockade on Qatar in, on June 5th, 2017. But it's a relationship that goes back uh, a bit further. Um, there was a partnership of sorts uh, between the two countries in the post-Arab uprisings when the, in the, in the immediate aftermath of uprisings in Egypt, in uh, Libya, in Tunisia, uh, and other places, uh, promised to bring uh, Islamist groups to power, and in a couple places did, at least temporarily. And it was the Qataris and the, and the uh, Turks who together invested time, uh, their political uh, resources, their diplomatic resources, and their financial resources in, in these countries. My sense is that for the Qataris, it was a, an opportunity, a tiny little country to build influence around the region. It wasn't as uh, tinged with ideology, although I know people will argue with me that, as much as it was for the Turks in terms of this kind of leadership role in the region and, and the kind of uh, Muslim solidarity uh, that it wanted to demonstrate. Um, it, it, it also, the relationship is also born of geostrategy. Um, the Turks do not have good relations with the Saudis or the Emiratis. Um, this doesn't just go back to the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. It goes back to the 2013 coup d'etat in Egypt. Uh, and the opportunity for the Turks to establish a presence in Doha uh, is something that um, is, uh, unnerves their adversaries in the region uh, and provides them a presence in an important, in a, in an important part of the world. It also plays very well. You know, Turkey is doing the right thing by uh, its Qatari allies. Uh, the Qataris have uh, provided financial aid to the Turks at important, uh, at important times. Um, the Iran piece comes in mostly because the Turks have economic ties with the Iranians. Um, Iran provides a good foil for uh, Turkey when uh, Turkey gets in trouble with the United States. Turkish officials have tended to run off to Tehran in an effort to sort of manipulate uh, the United States. Uh, and and, and um, it's also um, a way in the Turks have uh, closer relations with the Iranians in ways that are, are not apparent to everyone. Um, there's been a long running uh, case in the federal courts in New York relating to a Turkish state controlled bank that has been at the center of the largest sanctions evasion scheme uh, in the history of sanctions evasion schemes. Uh, it suggests, the proceedings suggest, that there's more to it than just, uh, than just the managers of this bank being involved in a sanctions evasion scheme and that perhaps um, more senior officials in the Turkish government were somehow cooperating with uh, senior members of the Iranian regime. We'll just have to see how that case unfolds, however. But um, it's really, it's born of those two things, economic ties and a way to leverage the United States. So, okay, uh, I'm going to skip around just a minute just uh, because the next one is also for Stephen. So I'm gonna do one for Eugene and then we'll go back to you, Stephen. So, uh, so Eugene, th this next question is, do you think that Putin will be emboldened by Russia's success in Syria to intervene elsewhere in the Middle East in the near future? Well, we're seeing uh, Putin's intervention uh, in Libya uh, by some reports with uh, even military boots on the ground, although I have not seen firm confirmation. But generally speaking, um, I belong to the school of thought that um, argues that uh, Russia is not a, an irresponsible actor that just throws its weight anywhere it pleases. The circumstances of the 2015 intervention in Syria were quite special. First, it's the 
oldest, perhaps, uh, yeah, uh, relationship uh, in uh, in sort of a, in 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 a Russian collection of um, clients in the Middle East, going back to the 1970s. Um, they have been in business with the Assad family, uh, Bashar al-Assad's father, right? Uh, it was the last um, client state of Russia's uh, in the Middle East that was on the verge of collapse. Um, by that time, the United States had made it pretty clear that with the exception of the counter ISIS campaign, the United States would not intervene militarily to topple the um, Assad regime. Uh, and um, also in Moscow, it was an opportunity to score one against the United States because um, I think Russian leaders believe that this is part of the greater kind of geopolitical great game by the United States to carry out regime change, even if the United States does not want to intervene in Syria militarily, but it's not a bad point to score against the United States by saving uh, a long-standing client regime. So um, we haven't really seen such a bold action elsewhere. Previously, I'm referring to Ukraine and Georgia, the Russian military intervened where uh, Russian core interests were at stake. Uh, defined by then President Medvedev in 2008 as Russia's privileged sphere of interest. The Middle East is probably the next concentric circle in that definition, but uh, not quite the same. So um, on the whole, I wouldn't say it was a safe bet, but it wasn't as risky and careless a move. And I don't expect something like that uh, to happen elsewhere in the Middle East uh, until the circumstances are right. Okay, thank you. All right, so our next question is for Stephen. So in light of the Turkish position as the defender of Muslims in the region, how would you analyze um, Turkey's response or lack of response to Russia's annexation of Crimea, the historic territory of Crimean Tartars? So it's a really good question. And um, this is one of those places, the, the Black Sea region uh, and the situation in Crimea is one of those places that um, is, interesting because of Turkey's legacy relations with the United States and its relations with NATO. And it's one of those places where, in theory, Turkey and the United States have a confluence of interests um, in that, you know, they would like to check Russian, the exercise of Russian power in the Black Sea region. Um, and some uh, U.S. government officials and former U.S. government officials have floated this idea as a way of beginning to repair the relationship between the United States and Turkey. Personally, I think it's kind of a, it, there may be a confluence of interest there, but it's not going to be the thing that's going to repair U.S.-Turkey relations. Especially since the Turks have at times been kind of mealy-mouthed about the question of Crimea. There was a moment when the Turks spoke out against this, but, um, essentially in response to a fait accompli and having broader, more important interests to them for which they need the Russians, they've been essentially quiet uh, recently uh, in, uh, when it comes to uh, the situation in Ukraine and uh, the annexation of Crimea. Can I just add something on that? I think uh, there is a but a mutual appreciation of where each country's core interests are. So I think uh, I may be exaggerating this, but for Russian leaders, uh, Turkey's position uh, in Northern Syria is something that is part of core Turkish interests that affects Turkish security in the most immediate sense. And there's a certain symmetry between that and Crimea. Crimea is part of Russian core interests, as is Ukraine. And I think that shapes their responses. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is about NATO, actually. So where does NATO come into the picture between Turkey and Russia? <laughs> I'm sure you both can, uh, can have at that. Why don't you uh, go first? <laughs> Sorry? 
Why don't you go ahead on the, that, and then I'll pick up. Well, uh, you know, I think uh, there is little appetite, uh, needless to say, on the part of Turkey's NATO allies to support Turkey in its standoff uh, with Russia. Uh, it is out of area. Uh, Erdogan has not exactly endeared himself to uh, his European and U.S. NATO allies by purchasing uh, the S-400 air defense system, which really, I would say, was a masterstroke on the part of Putin to sell to Erdogan that system. Uh, I'm not a technical person, so I don't know how capable, I have no, I have no basis for judging the capabilities of that system, but as a wedge between Turkey and the rest of NATO. Uh, it was a brilliant play, and it's not even clear that that system can be integrated in a meaningful way in Turkish air defenses. So uh, it really uh, was a, has been really, to the present day is, a major geopolitical coup for, for Putin. Uh, and frankly, right now, uh, uh, Europe, NATO, the United States have other problems to deal with that uh, give a whole new definition to our understanding of national security. So um, I don't see the allies uh, doing a whole lot for Erdogan under the circumstances. I, I, I agree with everything that Eugene said. And let me just point out two quick things. First, in the post-Cold War era, the Turks never believed ever, ever, ever that NATO would come to their side should there be any kind of problem. Uh, never, uh, always deeply, deeply skeptical of their relationship uh, to NATO. And then the second point I would make is that um, you hear it from time to time here in Washington about, oh, uh, Turkey should be kicked out of NATO. Uh, of course, there's no, uh, there's no mechanism for that. But I just point out that Turkey in NATO is uh, advantageous for Vladimir Putin. Um, I don't believe that you know, Putin is this kind of political master of pulling strings and pressing buttons and levers and so on and so forth just right. No one has a perfect theory of politics. But as Eugene said, he played it extremely well with the S-400. And it serves his interest to have a partner maybe that's too strong a word, but a partner within NATO. Because as I mentioned earlier in response either to a question or in my opening remarks, um, a, a Turkey as a partner of Russia and Turkey being a member of NATO um, helps to reinforce fissures and divisions within the alliance that the Turks had long perceived anyway. Okay, so we're getting, we're running up close to time, but we have a few more questions. So I'll ask, I'll ask one of these and then, and then maybe I'll group the last two. So, so we'll see if we can get to it. But, um, but this next one is that uh, Turkey is currently hosting a very large number of refugees who want to immigrate to Europe. And Turkey has uh, demanded and received a large amount of assistance from the EU to continue hosting these refugees. What do you foresee ultimately happening with the refugees? Uh, I think the refugees are going to stay in Turkey uh, forever. Um, to answer it very, very quickly. Uh, you know, first, let me point out that the position of the Turkish government now uh, that refugees should go home is a real change. Um, uh, for years, uh, President Erdogan and his advisors would um, tout the fact that Turkey was uh, upholding its responsibilities to refugees and welcoming people and taking care of them and integrating them into places like Istanbul and Gaziantep. And, and other places to draw a distinction between um, how well Turkey has handled it, its responsibilities, its uh, solidarity with fellow Muslims, um, in contrast to the way in which Europe and the United States have tried to slam the doors closed to uh, desperate, desperate refugees in need. Um, Turkey's politics shifted as a result of bad economic times, and Erdogan has picked up the idea of moving large numbers of uh, Syrian refugees back into Syria or in fact taking the dramatic step a number of weeks ago of trying to push refugees into Europe. I think um, any, uh, any studies of, of post-conflict uh, areas that produce large numbers of refugees 
makes it pretty clear that the vast majority of refugees do not go home and remain in the countries that initially hosted them. And that's, I think, what's likely to happen uh, in Turkey. And I have to say, um, you know, it really did benefit Turkish society. You had um, in Gaziantep, the entire uh, business community from Aleppo picked up and moved to Gaziantep. You have uh, Syrian uh, refugees in Istanbul who uh, have opened a number of really great, terrific restaurants. Um, I know I was benefiting from it before I couldn't go to Turkey any longer. So um, I think, uh, by and large, uh, those refugees are going to uh, are going to remain in Turkey. All right. So, so the final two questions are, you know, sort of opposite ends of the spectrum. But um, one is, how do Turkey and Russia deal with ISIS and its offshoots in Syria? And then the other is asking about the role that um, Israel plays amidst tensions between Russia and Turkey. Uh, and so I'll throw both of those out there, and it can be kind of a wild card. You can take uh, which whichever aspect you, you would like to deal with. Uh, so Eugene, why don't we start with you? Well, on ISIS, um, you know, of course, Russia has claimed that um, it played a critical role in eliminating ISIS and that its campaign was to a large extent, uh, is to a very large extent, mostly arguably, uh, aimed at uh, eradicating ISIS in Syria as well as other radical Islamist opposition groups. Um, now, that claim has been substantially refuted by uh, a large number of uh, military representatives from the United States. And um, I think there's some uh, evidence to um, suggest, in fact, considerable evidence to suggest that actually the Russian motivation was had much more to do with uh, eliminating opposition to Assad than going purely after ISIS. Um, I have not seen reports lately of how they go after the remaining ISIS presence such as it is. Uh, my sense is that they'll go after them if the opportunity or the necessity arises, the same way they've typically done that, and that is with uh, fairly indiscriminate bombing campaigns. Uh, generally indiscriminate use of firepower to uh, eliminate uh, such pockets of opposition as still may exist. Uh, and if in the process there are significant collateral damages, so be it. And, uh, um, you know, it's been one of these tragic aspects of Russian involvement in Syria uh, that, um, uh, you know, in Aleppo and elsewhere, um, it has resulted in countless civilian casualties. So I fear that if uh, something like that is repeated or um, ISIS once again sort of reappears and has a significant presence, this could be um, a repetition of that story. Now on Israel, very briefly, uh, that's a whole separate conversation really, but one of the remarkable stories of the past decade or so has been the blossoming of the Russian-Israeli relationship, and in particular of the personal relationship between Putin and Netanyahu. Um, it is, uh, I would almost describe it as a strategic partnership, not necessarily in any sense of a formal uh, arrangement because those don't really exist, but um, you know, there's a, at a remarkable degree of understanding, I would say, between uh, Israeli leaders uh, and Russian leaders. And even when they disagree, they uh, agree to manage their disagreements in a kind of reasonably, remarkably friendly manner. And uh, it's one of the stories that really deserves a much uh, greater exploration. But Putin, you know, considering, you know, considering Russia's history with Jews and anti-Semitism, Putin uh, has emerged as a very Israel-friendly and uh, friendly leader and uh, a patron of the Russian Jewish community. Just the other day, he sent uh, congratulations to Netanyahu for Passover. They talk all the time. Netanyahu visits there. Putin was there recently. So um, they respect each other's um, strategic interest there, and they do have a shared interest, uh, I would argue, 
and not necessarily, well, Russia has a shared interest in saving uh, or expanding the presence of the Assad regime throughout, restoring its influence throughout the entire country. For Israel, it is the least worst of the possible outcomes. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, if the alternative is total chaos in Syria, then certainly it doesn't benefit Israeli security interests. And Russians, again, it's a longer conversation, but have been very accommodating for understanding of Israeli policy in that respect, and in particular of Israeli strikes against Iranian targets in Syria. Uh, so uh, there's a lot more to be said about that, but that's a, a very interesting aspect of uh, this whole situation. Uh, let me just quickly comment on the on the, the two issues. I think what's driving um, in Syria, what's driving the Russians and the Israelis uh, is uh, the fact that the Israelis' primary target in Syria is uh, the Iranians. Uh, they don't like the Turks. The Israelis have recently identified Turkey as a threat, but in Syria, it is the Iranians. And I think that for all of the partnership, let's say, of sorts between the Russians and the Iranians in saving the Assad regime, um, I think that the uh, the Russians don't have really any love lost for the Iranians, and that's why they periodically provide the Israelis the permission to do what the Israelis want to do, which is to essentially engage in assault on the Iranian uh, positions in Syria. Uh, and it's something that the Israelis have been um, wildly successful in doing. Um, the Iranians have been unable to respond to the Israelis in Syria in any kind of meaningful way. And that is a result of the fact that the Israelis have gotten cooperation from the Russians for doing that. Um, so, I, you know, and then I think also it's important to point out, and Eugene um, intimated this, that the preservation of the Assad regime is the least worst of a bunch of bad options for, uh, for the Israelis, despite their relation, the Assad regime's relationship with the Iranians. If you go back to the early days of the Syrian uprising, the Israelis were actually reluctant to call for Assad to go. Um, the armistice line between Israel and, and Syria had been uh, quiet for a very, very long time. Uh, Hafiz al-Assad was scrupulous in ensuring that whatever violence between, uh, happened, it happened in Lebanon, not on the Golan Heights, not in Syrian territory. And the Israelis were not um, uh, were, were much more concerned about chaos ensuing rather than the Assad regime, which they felt they knew how to handle. Um, just quickly on the on the ISIS and ISIS and the Russians and the Syrians, if you brought it out, once again, the Turks and the Russians are on opposite sides here. Um, the Russians obviously uh, motivated uh, in part, uh, not in Syria specifically, but don't like the idea that the United States was supporting uh, uprisings and revolutions around the region that they thought Islamists, that Islamists would come to power and did. And the Turks are Islamists and have supported extremists in Syria. Uh, they have not initially uh, turned a blind eye to jihadis' use of their territory and their airports to wage jihad against the Assad regime, and then subsequently have coordinated, uh, coordinated with them. Um, of course, it's not, it hasn't been the central mission of the Russians to fight the Islamic State in, uh, in Syria. But again, um, it, it strikes me that the Russians and the Turks are uh, on opposite sides here. All right. Okay. Well, we will, we will wrap it up there. Just uh, thank you, Eugene. Thank you, Stephen. And because in the beginning... I was scrambling to hide from, from my children. I did not read your bios. So I just want everyone on the call to know that you know, you're, you're getting very good expertise. So Eugene Rumer, he is the Senior Fellow and Director of the Russia and Eurasia Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And prior to that, he served as the National Intelligence Officer for Russia and Eurasia at the U.S. National Intelligence Council from 2010 to 2014, and has held research appointments at the National Defense University, the International Institute for Strategic Studies, and RAND. He's also served on the National Security Council staff and at the State Department, among others. And uh, Stephen Cook is the Senior Fellow for Middle East and Africa Studies and Director of the International Affairs Fellowship for Tenured International Relations Scholars at the Council on Foreign Relations. He is an expert on Arab and Turkish politics 
as well as US Middle East policy, and as the author of several books, including False Dawn, Protest, Democracy, and Violence in the New Middle East, The Struggle for Egypt from Nasser to Tahir Square, uh, which won the 2012 gold medal from the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, and also Ruling but Not Governing the Military and Political Development in Egypt, Algeria, and Turkey. Um, and he writes and publishes widely. So um, credits at the end, thank you both. Um, Thank you everyone for joining. Our next call will be on Thursday with uh, Jamie Metzl, this Thursday at 12 o'clock with Jamie Metzl and it's about coronavirus um, and what comes next and what sort of international system might look like. So I hope you will all join us then. Again, Stephen, Eugene, thank you very much thank for joining. Thank you very much. Great Thanks for having us. Thank you. Take care everybody. Bye-bye.